Welcome, everyone. This is the last of the four Piercean Temperaments series that him and I have been doing. And um, I want to thank Mr. Pierce for being here for all, for all four of them. It's been super fun. Um, the temperaments come from his book, Motes and Beams, A neo Jungian Theory of Personality. Um, and I do want to mention that in my second book that I'm writing, the first book was Marble and Sculptor. The second one, it's untitled so far. One of my large chapters is in response to Michael Pierce and his four temperaments. So a lot of it's going to be what we say in this interview, but some of it's going to be more fully fleshed out thoughts about like why, for example, like why is there, is there a better word for the monarchic type? Is the aristocratic one better? So I'm going to write out my thoughts there and mm -hmm. I'm pretty much going to go through the temperaments. I don't think there'll be any disagreement. There might just be like, here's what I would add. Let's talk about, we're going to talk about the final temperament, which is anarchic types. So Michael, why don't you say what those types are and then tell us why you named him anarchic. Yes. So those would be the NFPs and the STJs. Um, they're the types that have N-E-S-I-T-E-F-I -E -E um, in their function stacks. So all four of those types have those, share those four functions. Um, and I called them the anarchic types because sort of continuing the Pardon me, uh, continuing the, the sort of pseudo political metaphors that I mm -hmm. have used for the other types. And also continuing sort of the, uh, I don't want to say narrative, but symbolic narrative that I was creating with them where you, you it doesn't really matter where you start because it's a cycle, but you have the aristocrats who are up in the mountains and they're the purely individualistic. This, these were my original ideas in the book. They're there because you you can imagine like mountain peaks right. that's and that go up to a single point and then you have going from peak to peak. Um, and then as you descend down, you have the theocratic types who come down from the mountains in order to try to speak to the masses who are undifferentiated from each other and mm -hmm. to try to explain these detailed or these individualistic ideas to them. So they're sort of turning into the masses. And then you have the city, which is the realm of um, the democratic types um, where, and we were, we were sort of discussing this before you have the, um, I think a good word might be rule of law um, to try mm. to describe it where, whereas in the mountains you have, it's very individualistic and you have each individual create doing their own projects and sort of um working with or against each other as individuals <laughs> down down in the city you have more cooperation and it's cooperation on the basis of notions of reason which are universal for all people or could apply in all situations um so it i call it dem i call it democratic because i was trying to get at that notion of pooled wisdom and also of Everybody gets a vote, and um, I, I, I'm adding all these caveats because I've I've gotten some I don't want to say criticism, but people have been confused that I would rank the uh, or put the NTPs in that camp because they're <laughs> usually very nonconformist. But I still stand to that that they're Good. in that area. But anyway, so those are those are those three. And then what happens in this sort of symbolic narrative is when you leave the city the city where you have the rule of law and the, and the democracy, um, you are going back up into the mountains. And those are the quote anarchists because they're the ones who are leaving the city in order to go into being individualistic. Um, and so anarchist was my attempt to uh, come up with a word that fit nicely with the, with the other ones in terms of the political metaphor and also to designate the notion of um, uh, breaking breaking away from uh, collective universalist rules in order to sort of become your your true self. Um, so that's kind of what I was trying to get. Okay. Then I will note that you may have had a Freudian slip at the very beginning. You called the monarchic types the aristocratic types. Yes, I did. Well, <laughs> I've started. I I I've started becoming a little more flip floppy there because, oh, okay, in some way monarchic is harder to say than aristocratic. <laughs> okay, but um, I I flip back and forth a little bit, and I think that's partly from from our discussion before. But yes, in the book, they are officially called the monarchic, and 
there, uh, in some sense, that's more accurate to what I'm getting at. Sure. It's the true antipode to the to the demos, the right. democratic. And you don't you don't um, you lay out your criteria for why you say that. I'm only saying like it. You know, it would almost be interesting to call them that, but you don't. You're not wrong because you've laid out. Well, by my criteria, monarch is right. more accurate than aristocrat. So no, I'm not. So there's no one saying like, oh, I think it's better. Um, right. This is something I will. I will write in my book too. So <laughs> it's also it's just kind of funny because um, when you think anarchic, um, you sort of think introverted sensing ESTJ ISTJ would be much more conformist to tradition and how things have always been. So that that's another thing where I'm like, Hmm, what is, but then I also think like there is a sense of, of in the same way that NTJs don't allow anyone to tell them what to do unless the person is very respected. They, they like that person right. is on my level. I feel like with the ISTJs, you also get a level of, no one tells me what to do unless like I believe that person has the power to tell me what to do. And maybe that's just a TE thing. I don't know. Where, where am I going with this? <laughs> I, no, I think, I think that's right. I think um, the stereotype of the STJs, it's more of, of um, the stereotype is of sort of like worker bees or something. Cause yes. I think that's an archetype that a lot of us have where we have the archetype of the worker bee people, like the drone people who are mm. do all the boring stuff that we don't care to do. And so when people first learn about typology, they assume that some of the types necessarily um, conform perfectly to some of those archetypes. And the STJs often get lumped in there. And um, there are reasons for that, but... I, I have been finding that there is a nonconformist side to the STJs that mm -hmm. isn't uh, understood as well as as maybe it could be, um, but it there is a there is a conformist side too, um, and it's difficult to uh, I, I'm it's difficult for me to go further than that. Uh, right. I'm still kind of working out all the details, but I do think there, um, yeah, like with the ISTJ. Uh, there is definitely a sense in which, um, well, you know, I actually, a better way of putting it would be uh, when you encounter STJs, even though, like a good example would be, I knew an ISTJ who was a doctor um, or he was in medical school. Mm. And there was one time when he, we were doing some kind of like, uh, it, it, he was a member of our church group. Um, we were doing some kind of activity where we were, <laughs> We we're basically going to start um, a Nerf ball war or whatever, like shooting Nerf guns and stuff. And we had set up like barricades using the chairs. And he he had finally arrived and was like, no, no, we can't do that. You, this is like, you have no idea how many people break their necks. Like you're going to jump onto these things. And this, like he just, and he just one by one just started going through. He didn't care what anybody said. He just started putting the chairs away. Oh my, okay. And it's like, so on the one hand, people would look at that and say, oh, you spoil sport, you, yeah. you know, conformist or whatever, you're implying the rules. And yet, in fact, he was the most nonconformist person there because he didn't care what anybody said. He was right. going to put all the chairs away um, because that was what was, you know, and he sort of reveled in the fact that he knew that people would hate him for it. But he's like, well, it sucks to suck. You know? Yeah, it sucks to or suck. Yeah. Yes, exactly. <laughs> so they kind of have that side to them. Um, which is not how we normally think of it, but uh, of somebody sort of acting as an authority figure. Um, and yet uh, they're not, they're doing it in this very in individualist way. Yeah, I don't you're right. No, it, it actually makes more sense because it's like, if you think about FE as the group, then you say, well, ISCJ doesn't care about the immediate groups. Like if, hey, we're all going camping. Well, I'm not. And they're like, well, but we're all going. It's like, I don't yeah. care that you are going, but I am not going. But like more on a... Because of this, this, and this. Yes. You know? But on a global scale, like the way things ought to be or the way things do go in a, you know, this is the way that we do government. ISTJs would do well on that because the structure makes sense. Yes. But in individual group settings, the ISTJ is more like, nope, you guys have fun, not going. And you cannot convince them to, go yeah. to do it. So... Um, let's go to some of the, I want to break down some, uh, individual parts of the book. So on page 198, you have a quote, this is from the, um, this is the, what you call the veteran, which is the ISTJ. That's how you label yeah. ISTJ. 
And there is a quote from Eisenhower saying, quote, this is a long, tough road we have to travel. Fake reputations, habits of glib and clever speech, and glittering surface performance are going to be discovered and kicked overboard. So it's like shiny. And you kind of wrote shiny. You said, uh, Jeff Bezos, don't get addicted to shiny because shiny doesn't last. It's a great mm-hmm. ISTJ mindset. Yes. So it's it's, it's that, that combination of that combination of both anti FE and sort of um, uh, uh, anti SE going on there, sort of a rejection of the two functions that I'm starting to think. Both FE and SE, I think, both have a presentation side to them. In the book, I talk about SE as having the showmanship quality to it, and the ISTJ rejects both of those. And so that's why you get, and I think that's also where you get some of the conformist stuff because the ISTJ doesn't care if what they're doing seems boring um, to other people because who cares yeah. what you people think it looks like? It works. And right. so, um, and that's not all of them, obviously, but that's where I think the stereotype comes from. When right. in fact, it's the opposite of conformist. It's actually, it would be more conformist to try to seem more individualist if that mm. makes sense because that's what our society values so right yeah so that's that's a very good way of putting it um and okay so that's that's like a one of the quotes from here so then you have on page 200 you have the enfp which you label the explorer and uh, you have a quote from uh huxley saying yeah. too much consistency is as bad for the mind as it is for the body consistency is contrary to nature contrary to life the only completely consistent people are the dead <laughs> and like obviously an extreme example of consistency being negative but yes. it is amazing to see the exact contradiction between how strong the si point makes their side well mm-hmm. the eisenhower is right but then you read huxley and you're like well of course like who wants to be lame and boring and what you just said earlier about like a spoil sport explain that talk about that yeah so that's that's a perfect example of how you can get such different sides within the same temperament and yet the underlying principles are actually the same um because the enf notice that he never he's not talking about um showing off to other people per se he's talking about because the enfp is the opposite of the istj they're at opposite ends of the spectrum you'll find with the istj that So they emphasize the SI side, which does have this belief in consistency and does have that that sense to it. Um, But the ENFP is, that's the most inferior part um, (laughs) of of the spectrum. Because what really matters in the temperament is, um, because you could have, say, an ISFJ, right? So if you compare the ISFJ versus the ISTJ, um, which I've actually had the opportunity to observe that a little bit. It's fascinating where the, um, there were, I remember seeing, actually a better example was, I remember seeing a disagreement between an ESTJ and an ESFJ. And, mm. and that was fascinating. They were very civil with each other, but it was um, <laughs> over, I can't even remember what it was, but what it ended up, what I realized it ended up coming down to was the ESTJ was like, well, I mean, but we're the ones who are going to use this thing. So we should, I, I don't, we should get priority over it. And, you know, we need to work through and get the schedules figured out so that we have priority, but we basically deserve this thing because we're actually going to use it. It was sort of this more TE argument. Um, whereas the ESFJ was like, yeah, that's true. But the rules say like, in order to be consistent with, the whole grand scheme and sort of this Kantian sense Mm -hmm. is like, I just still don't feel like it's fair that, you know, and you saw what was going on was the ESTJ who possibly was an ENTJ, but I think they were ESTJ for other reasons, but it's the same principle. They were trying to set up this gradation of rank of that (laughs) depended, depended on the, the external facts of like, (laughs) If we use it more, then we should have it more. And you guys don't use it more. So why would we give you more time that you're just not going to use? We deserve it. Whereas the ESFJ was like, but that makes us feel like we're better than them in this Mm. weird way. Like, 
Whereas, you know, we, we need to keep the rigid strictures because who are we to go in and say that we deserve more? So yes. I, I can't remember where I was going with that, but um, I think it, it was contrasting the fact that in both the ENFP and the ISTJ, you have a rejection of that ESFJ side mm -hmm. um, or perspective of things where, um, it, though it's, it's complicated because... Yes. It's complicated by the fact that ENFPs and, and ISTJs, but especially ENFPs, will be the first ones to call people out for being, they, I don't know if they'll use the word unfair, but they, they, one of the reasons I used anarchists was because I was trying to convey with the, with the monarchists or the aristocrats, whichever one you want to do, um, the mountain peaks are different heights of each other. <laughs> Everything is differentiated. It's like Nietzsche, order of rank, right? Yeah. And the anarchists, although they, they understand the TE sense of different people should have different things that accord with them, they also have a sense of the equalization. And the notion of anarchists, I think, gets that because anarchists don't like hierarchies. Um, right. They, they don't. They they're they're they fine like, with they having like spectrums. They like spectrums. They don't like they this. like a <laughs> uh, another image that I I didn't want to use, but I could have and was um uh <laughs> because I knew that there were a lot of people who would just it would be even too confusing for the but I I was considering using the notion of like merchants or of like I don't want to say capitalists but like. Plutocrats or something. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. And the reason for saying that is because I had the notion of a marketplace of ideas where everybody has separate stalls, and you can go buy uh, as long as you have the money. You can go buy to your heart's desire from any of these stalls, and it's sort of this notion of like everybody's equal, but everybody can also follow their heart and dreams. Everybody has a right to be individualistic. So it's like there's this tension. Right between the um, between those sides, if that makes sense. Yeah, it does. It's kind of a good sagu to the next thing, which is um, speaking of like you kind of mentioned idealism. The idealist. I think, which I think the, you mean segue. No, sagu. Sagu. Oh, okay. I'm being you just, dumb, okay. Michael, I'm being oh, you were stupid. being. You were making. Okay, I just was worried for a moment that <laughs> you thought <laughs> I was I like if it. I don't say something. No, 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 no. I'm keeping this part in, audience, because oh, okay. Michael <laughs> thought I, I was too dry. I was too dry. So on page two hundred seven, you have the INFP, uh, which you call the idealist, which is, of course, everyone would say that. I think. Yeah. Um, so then you say, um, this is a quote from you: their desires and their mysterious self or ego from which those desires arise is incompatible with both society and the universe at large. I can agree with that there. Um, one part that I, on page 208, the next page at the very bottom, I wasn't quite sure if I disagreed. I was like, I don't know if I see that, but you said, when the idealist dream or desire is incompatible with reality, rather than alter the dream in negotiation with reality, they intensify their belief in that dream and their corresponding efforts to actualize it. Thus, the greater incompa incompatibility with reality, the more intense and pure one's dream you must be. Hmm. Yeah. The, uh, what I was trying to get at there is the fascinating tendency that I think you find, and you'll find it more in some INFPs than others, depending on kind of how much they really do lean into their type. But it's the notion of, I've just met so many INFPs who are genuinely fascinated with or have this appreciation that I often struggle with of the genuinely tragic character and yeah. the tragic character who is tragic because they have a dream that is, it's sort of like the romanticization of Don Quixote mm -hmm. where like he has these noble ideas and these things that he wants to be that is his true self but it's there's a recognition that it is simply not compatible with reality. And there's a fascination with the notion of, well, he's going to do it anyway, even if the universe crushes him for it. And oh, how beautiful that this flower, you know. And I think that's where you get, because they'll get very fierce in defense of, um, of um, I think an image that I use is, is there's nothing more, 
anger inducing for them than seeing this beautiful little flower that is unique in, in uh -huh. every way growing up between the sidewalk cracks and then seeing like this soulless pest control company coming and saying, no, we can't have this flower here and just plucking it out. And they're like, ah, <laughs> like, you just, no, yes. don't do that. And, and it's like, you know, the ENTJ is like, well, but they're growing fine over there. I have the designated spot. And yes. it's like, no, it was the sidewalk cracked flower. It had every right to be there. You don't have a right to say that. Um, you have so. two, you have two quotes here and you kind of, you mentioned the flower you said, and, when that flower is beaten down by the sun, they mourn as for a martyr. And when the sapling is uprooted by uncaring city workers, they are incensed. And yeah. then you say the same uh, farther down, it's from, um, you kind of mention this motif. You say there's a prominent motif in FI literature, the death of the individual and their assimilation into a generic whole. And the example you give is the big brother Orwell. Yes. Just like yes. how it's, it's nonconformist totally. Um, so the anarchic type fits for sure there. And being seen as part of the tribe or part of the whole is is terrifying. Yeah, I I would add in the caveat that um, I think the ideal that and it's particularly evident with the NFPs, but I think it's actually I think it's latent with the STJs, even though they don't come off this way because they'll be. But I'll get to the STJs in a moment. But with the NFPs, it's particularly clear that they do want community. But they they want the community to be like, uh, yeah. There's no other way to say it. This like sort of perfect diversity mm -hmm. community where mm -hmm. there's community, but at the same time, everybody feels able to fully express themselves. It's mm -hmm. it's easy, particularly for me. I think I have unconscious theocratic prejudices where it's difficult sometimes for me to talk about it without wanting to sort of make fun of it because <laughs> my unconscious is always whenever I hear that I'm always like but but if you don't have like where is the self-sacrifice for the community like where <laughs> is, are people obeying like you can't because it, the theocrat just in the moment they encounter that they're instantly like well what do you do if there's a serial killer well, then you have to deny their way of life. And it's like, that's, and and they're like, mm -hmm. stop bringing in the serial killer thing. Like you're ruining it. And they have better arguments than just you yeah. ruining it. But um, where was I going with that? Oh yes, um, they do want community, but they, they want the community to be like this anarchist community, uh, if you will, where everybody is free to be their, their full selves um, but what's specifically terrifying is the notion of everybody giving up their their true selves in order to conform to this sort of mass man conglomerate. I don't know. I feel like um, we need to do another series, but this the series was awesome. And uh, it's yeah. what I like about it is it got me to dig more into your book. And then it's interesting, like what I did and didn't highlight and rereading it yeah. again. I'm like, I should like I'm, I'm I missed that. And it's just like you know, it's just good to to read books again because I retain like 1% of everything. So um, any last words of wisdom holistically about the temperaments? Um, I will be, my goal is to finish my second book by the end of this year and probably not publish it till my other book has like at least a year to kind of percolate out there. Um, but I'm going to be writing my uh, responses to this in a more formal manner, mm -hmm. but anything you want to say, kind of looking back on the temperaments now that you've had some time to get feedback. Well, honestly, the, the first thing that springs to mind about what I would like to say, this is the very first thing, and it's so corny, but I mean it, um, is love everybody. Okay. Um, there's, there's, that's one of the reasons I, I wrote the book, was to try to help as much as I could in a deeper, more meaningful way to help people learn how to love each other more um and it it you know it doesn't mean you let yourself get walked all over but it enables you to, to be able to appreciate the other temperaments and to you know read the book and see where you actually get angry <laughs> with the other temperaments and see oh that's why i get irritated with so and so that's you know that's what's going on here and you know try to to take take the take the wheels or out from underneath yeah um rip the rug out from underneath uh some of these 
uh, irritations that we have with people that we otherwise don't have words or concepts for. So, yeah, yeah, that's great. That's a very um, noble reason to write a book. Well, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> well, Mr. Pierce, thanks so much. We'll have to, I'll have to come up with another series that we could do. Um, yeah. And uh, thanks for the time. And everyone, if you haven't, I'm embarrassed to say that if you haven't bought this, you're doing yourself a major dis- disservice. But Michael Pierce, Motes and Beams, and Neo, Jungian and Theory, Personality, I'll put it in the description. Mr. Pierce, thanks for being here. Thank you for having me. I tried to live without you. Just can't go.